This episode of the Cascadian Beer Podcast has been made possible by the BC Ale Trail. Arrive thirsty, leave inspired at bcaletrail.ca. The challenge with many breweries is thinking in terms of longevity and how that might continue as a family-run business. Welcome to the Cascadian Beer Podcast. My name's Aaron and I'm a Cascadian. I have a background in radio and television broadcasting. I'm a music producer and have a passion for beer. I don't consider myself an expert in beer by any means, but I do enjoy and respect the craft and the passion of the craft beer industry. Cascadia is a bioregion in the Pacific Northwest and the North American continent. It's made up of the U.S. states of Washington and Oregon, as well as the Canadian province of British Columbia. In this podcast series, I profile the unique breweries of Cascadia, a region that has a strong presence on the international beer scene. If you enjoy this episode, please make sure you're subscribed wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss any episodes. Also, please feel free to share to help continue the support of this podcast series. I've traveled to Kamloops, BC, a town that isn't new to craft beer, but still is trying to find its place in the market. In this episode, I visit Red Collar Brewing, a family-run brewery in the heart of downtown Kamloops. My name is Lara Beardsell. And my title is sales and marketing manager slash daughter of David Beardsell, the bottle washer and brewer, I guess, sort of Mm -hmm. (laughs) part-time brewer, (laughs) part-time brewer. Yeah. I actually haven't uh, brewed now in, I don't know, three months. It's been great. Well, we're going to need you to brew next week, I think. So, yeah. (laughs) All right. And uh, we are in beautiful Kamloops. And uh, what is the name of your fine establishment? So this is Red Collar Brewing, Mm -hmm. named for our lovely dog, our original first dog, Goosey, but now carried on with our second dog, Diana, Mm -hmm. who's jingling in the background. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just playing with herself. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Who who wears a red collar. Yes. 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 And uh, why the red collar? Why not blue? Why not yellow? Honestly, Goosey just wore a red collar. That that was just something. She was given a red collar early on in her tenure with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the 11 years that she was our dog, she always wore a red collar. And when we came down to naming red collar, we did. She was a black lab, just like Diana's a black lab. And we did float black dog. Yellow dog opened four months before we opened. So thank goodness that we did not go down that road and have all of our branding ready because (laughs) that probably would have been even more confusing than all the red something. And and many late nights to change it too. Yeah. 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 So we went with, with red collar black dog was actually trademarked and we, we just couldn't, it wasn't an option. So uh, we got a little bit more creative and and red collar was what stuck. Mm-hmm. How did beer find you? Hmm. Well, I was a uh, lonely. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I, I was working in the hospital system down in Vancouver and hated it with a passion. And, you know, I, I always say the, the people that I admire the most in the world that are those that work in the hospital system. It's, it's a tough job. And, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it really takes that, that, type of person to do it. And I, I loved beer then. Uh, my wife and I at the time are, yeah, we went over to Europe. I'd had a bad summer and uh, we went to Europe and I had this beer in Munich and it was cloudy and it tasted like bananas and cloves. And I just went, okay, so I can drink this here. It tastes like something it had the most amazing sort of structure to it. And all I can get in Vancouver that was different was old Vienna. Yeah. And I just said, oh, there's, there's, so there's more to life than the rubbish beer that we were drinking. Mm-hmm. And 
I, it just sort of stuck with me. And so from that moment on, I just started focusing on beer as a study and I started to go to German classes. And about two years later, we, I just, I quit and, and got on a plane and went to school in Germany. Right. <laughs> and um, obviously you were homebrewing still when you were working in the hospital system, right? Yeah, you know, I, I homebrewed a bit. I actually did more when I was in high school of all bizarre things. <laughs> right. And I had stopped then because we lived in an apartment in Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, but uh, really, it was the fascination of the science of it that caught me at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even even the home brewing, like you couldn't buy grains. You were buying, I don't know, those cans. Yeah, the Coopers. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and so it was pretty limited. Then a year later, on our second trip, we ended up going to Belgium. And um, Anna Marie and I, my wife, and I went to Chimay. And we ended up spending three days actually at the monastery. And I, at that point, I knew I was sort of hooked and, and, and sort of dove in full time. Because that's a pretty hard place to get inspiration from, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, to this day, now, I mean, Lara was the last one back there, which was... Tessa was there as well. Tessa was there. Um, oh, yeah, you got robbed there. Um, yes, we did. <laughs> we were uh, at the monastery. Anna Marie was the last woman ever to be allowed into the brewery. Right. So we we had a full, I think it was a full five-hour tour of the brewery with the, the two monks that we knew, which is Father Theodore and Father Charles. It was just such an experience for me that I just said, well, yeah, this is what I have to do. That really just cemented my sort of belief that I had to go to school. And we, uh, and I, and I, at that point, I believe that there was going to be this renaissance of, of brewing and of the sort of craft in North America. And just, we just sort of went with that. Actually, that was 1982, 1983. So I ended up going to school in 87. And then after school, did you work for somebody or did you have another brewery after that point? So I went from um, uh, my schooling to actually working in England for a research laboratory called the Brewing Research Foundation. And I did that for quite a while, actually, and, and had some great stints with them. Th that was just a wonderful job. And <laughs> yeah, even though I had an English passport and, and we were very settled in England, we couldn't make any money. Uh, so Anna Marie worked as a teacher and I, I worked as a scientist and we were poor as church mice and, and, you know, we kept on wanting to get an apartment and that's, and we ended up, we just couldn't do, it. we just didn't have enough money. So we stayed with friends and whatnot. And then we went from there, I actually worked at a brewery in India of all places and then Samoa, Western Samoa, mm -hmm. a town called Apia. Mm -hmm. And we uh, built a brewery there, uh, which got destroyed during the hurricane of uh, Cyclone Val, it's called, mm -hmm. uh, which was a disaster. And then came home and uh, went and worked for Okanong Spring. Mm -hmm. Which I, I believe to this day, um, that Samoan brewery still brews in New Zealand, and then they ship all the beer to Samoa. I think, I think well, it's interesting you say that because I actually looked it up mm -hmm. uh, about two weeks ago because I have a friend in Apia right now. And no, I don't think it exists. Mm -hmm. And it, what was interesting was is that we were using the original Red Hook brew house. And so I don't think it is there mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, there are two two breweries there, Balima, uh, which is actually owned by Heineken and another, um, uh, you know, micro, you know, locally owned one. Mm -hmm. um, but I do not think that they're related to the one that I worked at. All right. And then uh, come back to Canada. And where did you, where did you settle? So we, we, we settled in Verdon. Um, so I started working at Okanagan Springs and, you know, it was pretty clear to me at the time. So the big boys then were Okanagan Springs, of course, and Shaftesbury. The Shaftesbury boys were rolling real hard. Vancouver Island was up and really that was it. Mm -hmm. Like that was the scene in BC. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is before Matt Phillip came along too, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 Uh, and yeah, Matt was working at a small brewery in Victoria at the time and he hadn't come up with his credit card scheme yet. And uh, yeah, we, we um, decided that we had three towns. One was Nanaimo, one was Kamloops. And I just, we can't remember what the third one was. 
But the water in Kamloops was the one that did it for us because the water here is identical to the water in Pilsen in the Czech Republic. And that was really a style that I wanted to work on. Um, very similar to the Bavarian water also, the Hefeweizen. So we took a chance on, on Kamloops. So, yeah, it's been pretty good. I'm in conversation with Red Collar Brewing. I had a great time when I was in Kamloops. And now, if you want to explore, you can with the BC Ale Trail. At bcaletrail.ca, you'll find the newly launched Ale Trail for Kamloops, Shushwap, and Vernon, where you not only get suggestions on what breweries you should visit, but also what pubs, local restaurants, and other activities the area has to offer. While you're on the website as well, you'll find a comprehensive list of every craft brewery in BC, a calendar with great beer events, and a blog featuring great stories of BC's craft beer scene. So whether you're planning a visit or just being a tourist in your own backyard, let the BC Ale Trail guide you to your next beer adventure. Arrive thirsty, leave inspired at bcltrail.ca. All right, let's jump back into conversation with Red Collar Brewing. And so then what uh, year do we open here? Red Collar? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Well, Red Collar opened in 2014. Mm-hmm. That chance that was taken on Kamloops was taken in 1992, right? So I was born... No, sorry, that was 1994. I was born in Vernon when dad was still at Okanagan Springs. We moved to Kamloops, opened the first brewery that we owned in Kamloops, which was Bear Brewing, which was where I grew up. <laughs> uh, so that's how beer found me. Mm-hmm. I just got, I just was born. Yep. That that was <laughs> pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Easy journey. Tessa and I both grew up at Bear Brewing, living, Bear, so Bear Brewing came and went Noble Pig opened, and then we – it still exists, but we are no longer a part of it. And and then Red Collar, the current project, the Terminus project, I would say, is – Well, the Terminus project for mom and dad. Yes. That's where the kids come in. They they get to do yeah. I mean, stuff I, going I, I watched I watched my parents open, sell, or turn over in some way breweries from the age of – a year and a half to uh, Red Collar, which opened when I was, you know, 22. The Noble Pig, even even though I was much more involved in opening the Noble Pig, I was still 16, 17 when we were doing that project. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit different. So the involvement level from the rest of the family, not just mom and dad, has been a lot higher mm-hmm. for Red Collar. So 2014, October 2014, we opened the doors here. So we're just coming up on... Uh, four years. Mm-hmm. And it was just you and the noble pick at the time when you opened, right? Like in Canada? Yes. Uh, yeah. Technically speaking, the uh, building where uh, Bear Brewing uh, was, it's still a brewery, still a functional brewery. They still produce on contract a right. lot of different products. So they are still there. And we have had employees who have worked up there and then come down here and got onto a smaller system and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But yes, when we opened in 2014, we were the only two, us and the Noble Pig. And we'd opened the Noble Pig in 2010. So, and, you know, Bear Brewing for that before that in 1994. So, you know, Kamloops wasn't super rapidly gaining breweries, that's for sure. But that that's definitely changing. And so when you opened the doors then, uh, what was the response from uh, the community? (laughs) It was slow right it was funny actually uh i was just up or i was just hanging out at the bar talking to i uh richard from iron road and uh and they said you know we were just so slammed those first two months it was just crazy and i i just kind of laughed and i was like you know it's it's great to hear that because when we opened our doors the first two months were pathetic i mean just. Well, l- let's clarify that. I mean, from a retail application walking in, it was very slow. Mm-hmm. And the building that we had gone into was what was called one of the cursed buildings oh. in the downtown. It had housed many really crappy businesses. Okay. And and so it it, it was sort of seen as a not a desirable building at all. And we loved it from the moment we first saw it, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't great, but our wholesale was really strong right from the get-go. But the retail, people walking in off the street, that that was a very tough go. Mm-hmm. Even even the first two months of wholesale, though, because, you know, our first sales rep, JP, 
who shout out to JP. He's a great guy. And he put on all the music at Brew Loops. He didn't really, he started going in December and then, and then the January after we opened, he hit the ground sprinting Mm -hmm. as fast as he could. Mm -hmm. The amount of accounts that guy picked up. He had cam loops locked and loaded three months. It was great. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, pretty much him going, going nuts for six months, put us at a point where we pick up accounts when accounts reach out to us, or if we happen to be driving by and it looks cool, we'll absolutely go in and say, Hey, Mm -hmm. but it's great now when I'm hiring, hiring sales reps, I'm just like, Hey, it's, it's really just an interfacing job. (laughs) Just show up, say hi, make sure that the customer's happy and that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so let's put this in perspective where after our first year, I think we're about 400% bigger at this point and we're maximum. We can't really get a whole lot bigger in the building we're in. So it's now a waiting game. Like, what do we do? Do we wait for this, for the industry to sort of settle down? Because it is sort of crazy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the expansion is just out of this world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're, we're really struggling with that right now. And I'm sure there's a lot of breweries in BC that are struggling with it. What do you do? Where do you put your money? What, what, you know, how do you expand? How do you, how do you retain your really great employees? You know, how, how do you, you know, give them something to keep them going for the next four or five, six years. So it, that's a big struggle for us right now. And, um, you know, Kamloops is Kamloops. It's, uh, uh, it's not, you know, it's not the metropolis of Vancouver and we're trying to understand, you know, where do we go? What do we do? Uh, you know, how do we retain our employees? That's the biggest key right now. And there's a lot of lessons south of the border too, like uh, the number of closures, like in major cities um, at the moment. So, I mean, there's a lot of lessons out there and I can see how that balance is difficult. Yeah. So we actually literally last night got in at 12 o'clock at midnight and we were down in San Diego and there are some changes in the the wind for sure. Mm-hmm. In fact, for us as outsiders, we saw the changes. Everyone we talked to said, yeah, you, you know, don't go there, there, and there because they're all going bankrupt right now. So it, it, it was very, very interesting It's not what I've seen in BC right now. I think that the industry is still pretty solid. Mm -hmm. However, it will happen. Yeah. It has to happen. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, what's that saying? Uh, when the U S sneezes, Canada catches a cold, right? So, uh, two years later. Yeah. So yeah, it takes a while. Um, so then with that, then what is the future of the brewery? And I mean, you can't really expand. So like what, what are, what is the concept for the brewery now? Just kind of in terms of where you're going. Yeah. So the future is, is really about the kids. So it's about Lara, Tessa, Adam, you know, these, the, uh, the people that are in the brewery right now. Uh, we have two new brewers that are getting their, their feet wet and, and just really solidifying their, their strengths as brewers. You know, that's what the next year is about. It's about sitting down with our employees and saying, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? For me, Lara was saying earlier that, you know, we've done three breweries in Kamloops. Well, I have built, I think, 11 in total now. And I'm ready to spend a little bit more time on a beach and doing some exercise and, you know, working more on my health rather than on making beer. So that whole future issue is all about... The, I mean, it's a, it's a young person's industry. Let's mm-hmm. just face it. It's not about being a, you know, an old fart that wants to make the beer that he made 15 or 20 years ago and sort of continue on. That's not what this industry is about. It's about innovation and motivation to make things interesting and fun. Creative. Yeah. And, and being creative. Right. And, and I, you know, I mean, I don't think I'm uncreative, but I don't. I don't go out enough, quite frankly, to know what sort of shake in the world. And again, what really struck us when we were in San Diego was, is how traditional it's all going back to Mm -hmm. this, this, the whole world of, you know, stupid is great. You know, we dump whatever you want into a beer and, and it will sell. That's not what we saw there. We saw, we had some great Meritsons mm-hmm. uh, for Oktoberfest. We had... Everybody's becoming competitive with the lager, like just... Because it's like, tough. Yeah. You know, a yeah. good lager is by far the toughest product to make out there. Mm-hmm. 
And yeah, we had like, we had, I had an ESB of all things at one brewery called Thorn Street, which was just sensational. So I think that that's the way the market's going to go. It's it's going to, the, the stupid craziness of it is, is settling down. And I think that there is going to be a lot of transition back to the traditional. All right. And Laura, you were telling me a story about uh, your driving product down to Vancouver quite a lot. So, so you're not serving only cam loops. Like it's, you have a bit of reach now, right? No, so. not, not, not anymore at all. I mean, technically speaking, I am responsible for the lower mainland, repping the lower mainland. And yeah, I have a good amount of accounts down there now, which is, which is awesome. We have retained self-distribution, which is the plan that is part of the whole growth idea. Uh, we, we want to be able to continue to do that. I use my deliveries as my point of contact with all of my customers. So I get to go in, talk to them, make sure that beer is moving properly and also drop off the product. But yeah, I make the trip down to Vancouver in the winter a little bit less, but on average at the very minimum every two weeks. And I'm taking cases and and kegs and every uh, six weeks or so, I try to get over to the island as well. So and then we go as far north as Prince George, out to Revelstoke, down all the way to Kelowna. Uh, so we keep ourselves busy. Yeah, that's, that's a <laughs> lot of miles on the car. Yeah. Um, between between two of us running all that beer around, we we definitely keep ourselves busy. So, but it's pretty fun. Mm-hmm. People, you know, the nice thing about selling beer, I would not call myself a salesperson by any means, and. Honestly, if I was selling any other product, I think I would have probably <laughs> tapped out a long time ago. But think about selling beer. Think about selling beer that you really believe in or a product that you really believe in is that it's a lot easier because you're very invested in the product. But particularly beer is nobody's really that upset when you try to sell them beer. No. Yeah. You don't get a lot of people who tell you to 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 go pound sand because they don't want beer. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not trying to sell advertising or something that people are going to hum and haw and go, I don't know if I need that. Most people who I'm approaching anyways, <laughs> so I'm not trying to sell beer to a bookstore. They want, they want beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, not the worst thing in the world. And it's great having a bit of exposure down in the lower mainland. Mm-hmm. It's, it's great when I can talk about red collar and, and somebody down there recognizes the name. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I, recognize, still, I recognize that red badge on on the label. So. Awesome. Yeah. That's what I like to hear. Slowly yeah. but surely, and it has def, that has definitely been our motto. Being up here, we have had the luxury of not being in the rat race of Vancouver, and we've been able to look at things from from maybe a little bit of a different lens, and we obviously would like to sell a little bit more into Vancouver and that sort of thing. But slowly but surely, when we get down there, when people want to pick up our product, we're there to to provide it. We're there to be supportive. But we don't want to push our product onto anybody who isn't you know, ready or interested. Haven't found that that's been an effective sales tactic in the past. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about succession a little bit. Where do you see the brewery going? <sighs> well, kind of like David said, it, there is this next year where we are just watching where the industry is going. At the end of the day, as you kind of mentioned, well, you mentioned this building and where we are. We're in downtown Kamloops. There is a parkade on one side of us and there is another establishment right beside us. There isn't a building for us to take over that is right beside us. So as far as expansion goes, we've got... One more place for another tank. Got one more glycol drop that we can use if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. We could put in a couple bigger fermenters potentially, but we don't have a lot of options if we aren't looking at building a new brewery. Uh, Or like a production facility. Or or a production facility. I'm not going to commit (laughs) in in a verbal contract to that right now, but check in in five years and we'll we'll see where we're at because we're pretty sustainable right now we're we're doing pretty okay and we can definitely coast at the level that we're at for a while watch how things go 
again, kind of that nice, having that nice perspective of not being in the rat race down in the lower mainland, we can just Mm -hmm. sit back, see what's going on. Go down every two weeks, drop it off. Go down every two weeks, hang out, try some cool beers, get a little inspiration, and then, you know, run back up to my hole in Kamloops and see what we can do. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and David also kind of talked about the retention of staff and, and getting good staff. I've got to say one that we've been incredibly lucky with some of our staff. It just, it's, it's crazy when people come along and they just fit and it's, it's being, we've, we've had hardships, but we've also had a lot of luck and things are really changing on that front because more and more people are wanting to get out of that uh, craziness of the lower mainland, uh, the housing market of the lower mainland, just general affordability of the lower mainland and the, you know, maybe just change of pace. Kamloops is expecting to see some fairly substantial population growth uh, in the next five to 10 years. And I think that that's going to be nothing but great for us uh, on an employee and a customer standpoint. And, you know, you can kind of see people even having the breweries up here uh, for brew loops and they're like looking around and they're like, oh, then, you know, this is like pretty cool. So, uh, you know, growing up here, I would, you know, elementary school, high school, you always talked about like, what is the population of Canada? And then what is the population of Kamloops? And I swear every single year it was like 80,000, 81,000, 84,000. And they're projecting that we're, you know, going to be breaching that 100,000 mark sooner rather than later and and surpassing and, and going kind of nuts. And I think that that will really shape where the future of red collar goes what the the change of demographic is going to be in Kamloops because I think it's coming and it's coming fast. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's just look at the the three craft brewers in Kamloops, which are Red Collar, Iron Road, and the Noble Pig. Of the brewers, so there's one, two, there's five brewers at those three locations. Four of them are from out of town. Mm-hmm. Three from Vancouver and one from the States, uh, Shannon, who's with us now, is from Toledo, Ohio. And so it just goes to show you that we need to pull people from out of the, I mean, I mean Tom, who is our other brewer, is from town, but he's the only one. And so, you know, getting that talent is is really tough convincing some of these people to live in Camels because it's it's not Vancouver it's not nearly as exciting as Vancouver you know there's just not a lot to do you get winter here so. you get really <laughs> yeah. horrible winters and um, they're not horrible they're fine come on try to sell Camels a little bit white, here this is people are going to listen to this <laughs> you know you know what it's not that the winters are that bad here it's actually getting to Vancouver that's horrible yeah yeah I mean, it's let's great face that it, we invented planes. Yeah, the yeah. the the the, the Coca Hell is just one of, one of the basically the worst roads on on Earth. But mm-hmm. um, you know, it's just it's just a very dangerous sort of pastime getting down. But I mean that that is the sort of thing that's very interesting. Is is that there's a lot of imports here right now, bringing a lot of interesting stuff into town, and uh, yeah, it's 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 actually pretty fun. If somebody was to come to Kamloops and visit, um, besides visiting your brewery, would it be some uh, activities that you could recommend that they check out? Coming to Kamloops, you have to want to do outdoorsy stuff. You can't be coming here for the nightlife because, I mean, it it does exist, but uh, you have to want to get out there, get a little dirty, go for a mountain bike, go for a hike, hit Sun Peaks, which is, I believe, the second largest uh, ski hill in Canada, just after Whistler. So, uh, you know, go enjoy the slopes, go canoeing, go kayaking, go camping, just you bring your dog, go and and check out that sort of thing because I, I mean that that is what I think sells Kamloops for people is there's space, there's hills, there's um, you know mountains. It's got a very weird, rugged, arid kind of landscape. People people are always very interested in in the way the the look of Kamloops. I actually we have a a new sales rep. Uh, his name's Carson. And he's been great and he, but he's been going out and hitting all of the in-town accounts and I've been going out with him a little bit. And when we get to the top of Aberdeen and you can look over the entire city, he's, there's just been a couple of times where he's just stopped me and gone, you know, it's just, 
it's just crazy. You could like look at look at look at that. And I grew up here, so I'm like, yeah, cool. Well, it's great. It's nice. There's all these barren hills. It's kind of weird looking. And he's just in kind of awe all the time. And he's from Ontario. And he's just like, this is just cool. It's just cool that you can see this. Every time you go out for work, we uh, we re- we went to Merritt and then drove back through Quilchenna. And it's just a really nice drive. And mm-hmm. he was just loving it. He's mm-hmm. like, I will drive wherever you want to go because it's just great. Mm-hmm. So... I definitely coming up for that sort of thing. We also have a decently evolving wine scene. So we do have five wineries here in town. Uh, so that's kind of cool to check out. Kind of a good thing to pair, honestly, with doing that outdoorsy stuff because mm-hmm. they're uh, all on the outskirts of town and that sort of thing. I mean, most of my activities revolve around eating and drinking, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> eating, drinking, and working. But... Yeah, you know, there's there's no shortage of ways to keep yourself busy here, that's for sure. But maybe being a little bit creative and definitely a bit active is strongly recommended. Right. And if somebody's wanting to go down the path of opening up a brewery themselves, what would be some advice that you could give them? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I again, we don't even have any idea of what the next year or two is going to bring with our little get together last night, which was, uh, basically all the brewers, uh, uh, from brew loops, um, just meeting up at red collar and everyone's in the same boat. They don't know what's going to happen. It's tough. The bankruptcy rate is certainly up, uh, which is the first time in the last seven, eight years, you know, it's been a, um, a very, very strong systematic growth. And that's not the case anymore. Um, there are some failures happening. And I, I, you know what? Uh, my, my recommendation is go to school, make sure you know exactly what you're doing, understand your science and, uh, and, uh, and then get some decent financial backers because it's, uh, it's, it's one of those industries that needs very, very deep pockets. And uh, you know what? If I had a genie in a bottle right now, it would be a pretty interesting, uh, look uh, at, you know, what is to come. However, very interesting industry. I mean, as long as you got some, so a real stiff backbone and you're willing to take some hits, uh, I I guess it is still an interesting industry to get into, but I'd be, I'd be super careful. Huge thank you to Laura and David for their time, especially since the uh, after party for Brewery Loops uh, went pretty late into the night uh, the night before. Um, really appreciate them uh, sticking to our scheduled time uh, the following morning. So thank you, too. And it was fantastic visiting the brewery. Really nice spot. You should go check it out. Uh, big thanks to the BCL Trail for making this episode possible, as well as Tourism Kamloops. Thank you so much, guys. Um, really liked my time at Brew Loops, which is a festival you should definitely check out um, if you're planning a trip to Kamloops. So, yeah, <laughs> keep that on the radar. And more information about that will, of course, be on the BCL Trail website. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, I really hope you subscribed, uh, if you haven't already, on your favorite podcast app. And uh, if you want to follow us on social media, you can by going to facebook.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. We're on Twitter at Cascadian Beer and on Instagram at Cascadian Beer Podcast. For more information and to follow this podcast series and hear previous episodes, you can do so by going to Cascadian.beer. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your time. And until next time, remember, support your local.